And the following interview was conducted with Carolyn Jones, uh, Associate Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs Emer Emeriti for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, February the 10th, 2009 at her home in West Lafayette. This is part two of the interview. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Carolyn. We'll pick Thank up you. where we left off. With the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, you were the university academic liaison. Mm -hmm. Tell us a about that. Well, for a long time, the Commission for Higher Education um, spent a lot of its time working on the financial piece of, of higher education and making budget recommendations and doing things of that sort. But in the 80s, it expanded its scope to be concerned about the academic piece as well, the, the academic offerings uh, of the institutions in particular, and trying to move, bring the institutions a little closer together and, and do a lot more cooperative uh, work on it. And, have all of the institutions look at some of the problems in higher education and try to come up with some way that each one of us could help solve some of those problems. And so as that began to develop, the, the executive vice president, uh, Tip Tyler, decided that he really needed to have somebody as an academic liaison down there. So that was one of the pieces of the position that I was hired for when I, when I went into that office. So there, there are a number of things that you have to do. Um, the law in the state of Indiana indicates that every new degree program to be offered, uh, that a, an institution, public institution, proposes to offer must be approved by the commission. So one of my responsibilities was to take each new degree program our board of trustees had approved and to get it down to the commission and help the commission see why that this was going to be very important, not only for Purdue, but for the state of Indiana and how this did not replicate something that was going on somewhere else, or if it did replicate it, that we had a big enough audience that it would be worth our while uh, offering these kinds of things. So I spent quite a bit of my time doing that. I also served on a number of different commission task forces that were looking at various problems in the state of Indiana, where we tried to sit down and together come up with some resolution for those. Were you the only person, did you have to testify at all or just present the documents and did other people go with you or at Barry uh, for a new degree program? For a new degree programs, yeah. frequently the, the presentation was done by the president of the university. And so my role at that point was trying to pull all the material that the president needed uh, to, to get that done. Uh, if the president couldn't be there, I, I did do it upon several occasions. but. Both uh, President Bering and President Jiski, who were the two presidents that I worked with in this particular capacity, um, made it a point to get to commission meetings. They, they felt that was very important that we have that presence down in, uh, sure. in, in uh, Indianapolis and that they be the ones representing the university. Right. And Stan Jones is the chair. That's right. right. That's right. And so much of my work was working with commission staff as they were trying to prepare a recommendation on whether or not. But the actual presentation in an open right. committee meeting was frequently made by the president. Right. But the documentation and getting all that material is a big job. Well, it is. But the, the faculties that want to propose the programs are the ones that have to do a lot of the work on that. And uh, you kind of oversee it, right? Well, my job was to help was to look at it and see whether I thought it was going to be adequate by the time it got down to Indianapolis because. Uh, I worked with it enough that I had a pretty good idea the kinds of questions they were going to ask, the kind of concerns that they had. So I, I was an internal coach, and then I would try to work with folks, well, did work with folks uh, down good in resource. Indy to, to help them see that this was really a sound program. Sure. Good resource. The University Student Learning Outcomes Assessment Council, tell us what the nature of that was and your involvement. Well, that was, that was really an interesting one. One of the... Um, what shall I say, standards, I guess, would be as, as good a word as any to use for it, that the North Central Accreditation Association put forth was one of student learning outcomes assessment. And the first time that was a piece of it for Purdue, anyhow, was in our last accreditation in 99-2000 with it. But the standard had been in place about six, seven years. And so we were coming down where people expected a lot more than would have been the case had there accreditation taken in place in 1994 with it. Um, we had been doing a lot of outcomes assessment all over the university, but it hadn't been pulled together. Uh, North Central insisted that it needed to be pulled together. So it seemed like the 
best way to do this was to pull together a task force, one from every um, college, a member from every college, and in most cases it was an assistant or an associate dean. And uh, because I was responsible for accreditation, I was the lucky person that got to chair this. So it was our job to sit down and figure out what was it we needed to do uh, in order not to have a stipulation on our accreditation as it related to assessment. And one of the really interesting things we faced was that North Central required an accreditation of general education. And Purdue doesn't have a core curriculum, nor do we have core university requirements. And so that, that became an interesting one for us to tackle. So we put together a very broad-based student learning outcomes assessment, which every college assess learning outcomes our, our expectations uh, for student learning, uh, at least in general education and a little bit in nature. And each college signed off on that, so at least we had something that we could begin to hang our hats on to, to get this done. Um, it was a group of folks that worked hard and furiously, and, uh, and we were successful. And I think the reason we were successful, probably several fold. One, we had every college involved in it. Secondly, when we had to make the presentation in North Central, the whole committee did it. And so we were each chiming in in different places. And the third piece on it, we had a sort of a fair a demonstration of, of two things. One was learning technology, and we combined these, and the other was student learning outcomes assessment where we brought together our faculty that were really doing very, very cutting edge things in both of these areas and were extraordinarily excited about what they were doing. Um, put that together in the ballroom over at Stewart Center about four o'clock in the afternoon and the accreditation team was in there and talking one-on-one -on -one with these people and they left so excited about what we were doing. And uh, so Wonderful. as a committee, we said, yes, we, we planned that one right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Student Services Internship Program. You were the director for that. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. That's a program that was run in conjunction with what was the School of Education at that time. Uh, student Services funded six positions, half-time positions for graduate students, and our, our commitment was to use students in the college of or school of education. So the uh, school of education would nominate people for this and we either accepted them or asked them to nominate more from if, if there weren't enough in their pool. And they were assigned half-time internships in like the Office of Admissions, the Office of Dean of Students, the Placement Office, the, first, and the Registrar's Office. We had some in... Uh, counseling and psycho or, um, psychological services and they were directly supervised by one person in each office but then I coordinated the program and had overall supervision for it and in addition taught a one credit course that went along with the program. For the interns? For the interns. Okay. And that was at a, a one semester? Uh, they, they were in it every semester they were an intern and some of them oh, were interns eight. for three years if, if they happen to be in a doctoral program now each year they were probably they were in a different office so I had an interesting situation of trying to teach a seminar that had both masters and doctoral students in it some of them in it for the first year some for the second and some for the third year quite a mixture and it was it was really quite a mixture and um we used to laugh about it because I always taught the course at noon because I wasn't paid to teach, but it was an important part to have as, as a core of an internship program with it. Oh, sounds good. Is it still going on, do you know? I, I really don't know whether it is or not. That's a good question. The uh, Purdue President's Convocation for Distinguished Students, for researchers, you might tell just what the, the nature of this particular convo is. Well, for a, for a long time... Um, this convocation was just for distinguished students. Now it's the university's honor, honors convocation, so it, is, it has grown dramatically since then. But the idea was to, on Parents' Weekend in April, Mother's Weekend, and they changed it to Parents' Weekend, to invite all of the students who had made what's now called semester honors or dean's list to a convocation where the president would give the keynote address um, 
visible, highly visible scholarships would be, be awarded and we would also acknowledge and, and recognize the senior, graduating seniors who somehow or other managed to get a 6-0 all the way through. Um, it was not unusual at all to have 4,000 plus students in their families there. This program was followed by school receptions after that, so families had a chance to meet the dean and meet faculty, and roommates' families could meet each other, in essence, that way, too, and, and make it just really a, a, a nice Friday night send-off for a Mother's Day program. Mm -hmm. But as I say, that has since gone into an honors convocation where all the faculty honors are given as well as the student honors, and which I think is a wonderful, wonderful yeah, It's idea. a good combination, I it think. It is. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, the university had academic advisors coordinating council. You were the chair for that for several years, mm -hmm. some years. What's the nature of that particular body? Well, I think I mentioned earlier that one of my jobs and my challenges and charges in student services really was to try and build bridges between student services and the academic community within. And as I looked at the academic community and became more and more familiar with what was happening, I realized there was one activity, i.e. academic advising, that went across all of these, but yet these advisors didn't know each other, much less talk with each other. And Only within their respective school uh, department. In, in their own school and department, they were fine, but they, there wasn't any communication um, beyond that. And I also discovered as I talked with them, they were all trying to discover the same wheel. Or if, if somebody had discovered it, they weren't aware of it, that there was a and so I, we talked with the University Senate about creating a committee under the umbrella of the Student Services Counseling Committee where we would pull head advisors together and get them talking with each other. And we would try it and see whether they thought it was useful or not. So we did, and they found it extraordinarily useful with it. They would get upset with me if I didn't call a meeting every month. With it, and then the then we broaden it also because there is so much interface between academic advising and the student service offices uh, to include some of those people from student service offices. So rather than having advisors sitting around and complaining that this and this and this wasn't working about registration, let's get the registrar in the conversation as well okay. with with all advisors. And so what we saw happening were not only was it, improved communication, but a lot of improved service. More conversation, get on the same page. Well, that's right, or even discovering what was on the page sure, within. Right. Um, if a service provider is not aware of how the people feel about the services being provided for, um, bad things can happen, right. and they're not even aware of it. And, and so we brought a lot of awareness. We brought both sides together, sitting down, trying to solve a problem, and we got a lot of problems solved with it. Oh, you do. I guess the, the buzzword today would be bipartisan, or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay. Um, Ivy Tech Community College, the Region 4, um, any con you worked with the former chancellor, Betty Doris, so you've been some, some involvement with Ivy Tech. I, had, yeah, yeah, I, I, I really had quite a bit uh -huh. uh, of involvement with Ivy Tech. I believe I mentioned earlier when it became apparent that something was going to happen as far as transfer of credit was concerned. Um, Purdue decided and Betty Doversberger at, over at Ivy Tech decided rather than digging our heels in and saying no, let's get at the table and make it happen right. And so I was the designated person from Purdue uh, to do that. And uh, we started out very slowly we had some state mandates, but I was so proud of our West Lafayette faculty. They they realized that it shouldn't be just a state mandate. It's If two courses were comparable, it was right to allow them to transfer. If they weren't comparable, then they shouldn't transfer. So there was an initial list of 10, and I think pretty West Lafayette with Ivy Tech Lafayette ended up with like something 28 on the initial list, and it continued to grow. But it's, it's a program that has to be controlled by faculty, and, they, and they've done it, and I applaud them because they, they've done it right. And well, so students are succeeding. Students coming from Ivy Tech to, to Purdue are succeeding. It was interesting. I, I just came from a Rotary Club meeting this afternoon. I was talking with somebody from Ivy Tech, and they said, this is just a ballpark guess on my part, but I think probably about half of our students are transferring to four-year institutions 
now across the state. Yeah. And isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it is. What did you uh, did this affect uh, the Ivy Tech and the community co and the regional campus ones? Was the transfer system wide? Yes, it was. Okay. Okay. Well, and, and that was important for Purdue too because sure. we couldn't have one campus running off and doing something. Uh, and then having a student go to that regional campus and then try to go to another campus that wasn't part of that agreement, that would be West Lafayette or another regional. Right, they? right. So, yes, there, there was a lot of conversation among all the Purdue campuses right. with that. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, diversity, including the Title IX coordinator and also affirmative action. You touch base with those groups and so whatever. I had had several opportunities to be in, involved in the diversity piece at Purdue. The, the first was the first year I was here in 1972, spring of 72. About a year before that, John Hicks, who was the executive assistant to the president, formed a commission on the status of women. And he named Beverly Stone, who's the dean of women, who happened to be my boss. Uh, at that time as chair Was the council of it. just for, La for Purdue? For West Lafayette. Okay. Uh, and so the first thing the council decided they would do would be to pull together a lot of data and issue a report on the status of women at Purdue University, at West Lafayette uh, campus of Purdue University. And so Bev asked me to do the staff work on that piece for her, and I was very glad to, to do that. And the report was known forever as the Stone Report, but it was the first report on the status of women at Purdue. And it, it didn't surprise anybody to um, see that the reports that there were very few, and it was outlined where they were and what rank they were in, and most of those that were in faculty positions were assistant professors. There were a few associates and maybe one or two full professors. I haven't looked at it probably since 1972, so... That included salaries, too, as well, um, did it? There, there was something related to salary, but it was more, more about numbers. Okay. But anyhow, it was a report, it was a piece of data showing that there was a real problem here, that the university then was able to, to use and as an instrument for trying to move the university forward and uh, become a more diverse institution with it. In 1976, then, I became the university Title IX coordinator, along with a lot of other things I was doing in, in student services. My work was aimed more toward student academic programs and student service kinds of things, and student activities. And my responsibility was to see that the university was in compliance in those areas with it. Um, so the onus was really put on the program heads to, to make that determination. And I, my role was to try, if there was a problem, try and help them solve it with it. And the area, of course, that was the, the most difficult, and I'm so proud of what these people did, was intercollegiate athletics, because that's before the time we had any intercollegiate athletics for women. And so what our goal was, was to come up with a women's intercollegiate athletic program that wouldn't drain a lot of the resources from the men's programs with it and um, I'm so proud of our people because we approached it a little differently than the other institutions did and we were the only institution in the Big Ten that did not have a federal compliance review. There, there were not any complaints from our students when people would look at things they were saying what we're doing was fine. Uh, we had a long term, term plan here as to how we were going to get from point A to point B to point C with it. and. Um, our people that were involved in athletics and the Faculty Affairs Committee in athletics just diligently worked to pull that off. I think there's, isn't there, I think Iowa still has a, do they have a separate thing or maybe not? Maybe physical education for men and women, I'm not, I may be mistaken on that, maybe not. I, I really I don't, don't know. know, I've been but, far enough away from this. But it's at, really, they very at well this point, this, And but, did that include what additional sports? for women you wanted to add on to. Right, well, you had to add sports. So yeah. you, didn't, you didn't have any with it. And so we were- It was were, just intramural, probably. Whether we, we had intramural, sure. we had club sports right. at that point, but we didn't have any intercollegiate sports. So one of the, the earlier decisions that was made here, and lots of other people did it too, but I think we were ahead of the curve in deciding to do it, was to define revenue generating sports versus what they call now Olympic sports rather than non-revenue generating. And we had two 
men's revenue generating sports at that point, football and basketball. So uh, the decision was made here, well, if we're talking about equality, let's, let's look at it from the number of sports. And so two women's sports were selected to be revenue generating, although everybody was aware it was going to take them a while to get to the point where they might be revenue generating. And uh, those sports were volleyball and basketball. Um, a second decision that was made here, and we were rather unusual in, in making this decision, I think, was to rather than immediately put all the money in scholarships, we would put it in coaches. And so we hired some first-rate coaches here who then were able to go out and recruit really top-notch high school players because they knew they were going to get to play for a good coach. Right. Uh, with it, and then moved our scholarship money in at that point with it. Yeah. And, and that really, I think, is why that Purdue was doing so well in these sports, particularly, the bit, well, particularly at the beginning, but there were a lot of people involved in that planning piece on it, and I'm just, I'm just so proud of what they did. Yeah. One comment, uh, you did some, you've done some teaching and student interaction. Any tips on the teaching and your involvement with that or working with the students? Do you like to share with us? Oh my goodness, tips. Um, involve students in what you're doing. Um, be project oriented if you can be, if what you're teaching allows to do that. Uh, empower students to teach, to learn, be their coach rather than just the one that is going to be the imparter of knowledge to them. Uh, point them in directions of things that will be useful to them. Let them discover on, on their own about this. Um, if you possibly can do it, divide them into groups. Groups might be only two people, depending on what size class you have with it, so that they're helping each other out with this. Um, anything that is interactive, any, anything. Of course, what I was doing was teaching uh, a course related to an inter internship program. So there were lots of things that they could take back in, in their internships and try to see whether it worked or not. Yeah. And they were picking up things from each office they worked in. And so bringing that back together and in talking about what's working in your area and why is it working. Uh, that's the history major in me. Why is it working? It's the same thing in the co-op. They go out on, on co-op and then they come back and they, and they have a co-op class and they share what they're learning. And, mm -hmm. and the other people in the other companies can do the same thing. So it's a similar. You have units within the university and they're coming back and sharing and everybody benefits by it. That's right. Yeah. So the group, and they're going to be working in groups and teams the rest of their lives. They might as well start now. That's right. And, and you tie it into some theory. Right. So that it's just not all practicality, that there, there is something to hang all of this, this practice on yeah. with it. Yeah, good. How about now the faculty fellow and Carrie Quad? Tell us a little about that. Oh, that, that was, uh, I, I really enjoyed that. Carrie Quad, of course, was and still is an all men's quadrangle. But we had both men and women uh, that were faculty fellows over there. Um, I mean, it was an interesting role for for some. I think they looked at me as a big sister. Others looked at me as a mother, and probably some of them as a grandmother. Um, I just wanted to be someone that they felt that they wanted to sit down and talk that they could talk with, and and that happened with it. Uh, some of my more interesting memories of of. Um, the faculty fellow program over at Cary Quad too involved that probably two or three times a year we would give the wait staff a night off and we would go in and, and work. And my favorite job was always serving up the food. And we've got the guys here. And uh, so I thought it would be kind of fun if you're supposed to give them one piece of chicken every once in a while, just slip two on a plate and make the mashed potatoes just a little bigger than it was supposed to be. And of course, the, the guys loved that. They, they thought that was terrific. Now the food service managers did not. And more than once, I have been reprimanded by a food service manager for getting just a few, like a little too much mashed potato in that scoop with it. And so it kind of, I must admit, kind of got to be a game that guys would watch and they'd say, she's gone, <laughs> and they would come back. Right. But the activities have changed a lot in the, in the program now. The dining and some of the winter whispers and some of the social events, some of them are no longer done in a lot of the dorms. Because I'm a fat fellow at Tarkington, and, huh. and uh, like we used to go to winter whispers, and they don't have that anymore. And uh, 
at Christmas time we used to judge the doors. We still do the judging of Halloween, the floors, but the judging of the doors hasn't been done in some time. And now, as we know, the dining facilities and almost all of the dorms, you have to go, they're centra- more centralized, you know, than they were mm-hmm. in my poor dining court or Wiley. So it's more difficult to go to the building and then, or to the dorm and, and be in the same building and dine at the same time. But uh, it, it goes, it's a good program. It, it, it's a very good program, allowing faculty and staff and students to get together on a, a very informal basis. As, as you were talking about this, I remember that one year, and I have no idea what the charity was, it's long escaped me, that Carrie was working with Windsor and they were having all of these races and so they decided that we better have a faculty fellow race too with it. And so we ended up with a tricycle race for faculty fellows. And I'll have you know, I won. <laughs> put that down in the award column. Put, put that down in the, the, faculty in, fellow in, award. In the, in the award column. I didn't get a faculty fellow award, but I did get a ribbon for being first in the faculty fellow tricycle where'd you race. Get your, where'd you get the tricycle? Where'd you get it? They got them from someplace, oh. I don't know. And you fit on there okay? Well, sort of. Kind of. I'm not sure. Okay, sure. sort of, kind of. We we but all we, but we were able to ride it. We we all made it work, yeah. and it's amazing sometimes if you put your legs over the handlebars, what you can you make happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, any topics that, that uh, we would like to return to, or any summary comments that uh, looking at your notes, anything that you'd like to share for the uh, interview? Probably just a concluding statement that. I was ever, ever so fortunate to come to Purdue and then to be able to continue my career here. The university was very, very good to me. I'm a person that loves challenges and opportunities, and and they gave those to me. And and I thrive in that kind of environment. And I was very, very fortunate, too, to, to be in an environment of colleagues for a long time. And I was the only woman in, in uh, central administration that was, was not an administrative assistant or a secretary. But to have the support of my colleagues, um, to be able to do kinds of things uh, together and, and singularly too, if that was, was the situation, depending upon what the, the opportunity was with it. Uh, but to know that my colleagues were there, that, that was just wonderful. Good. And, yeah. I, and I hope that, that uh, Maybe part of my legacy on that, anyhow, is that I did all right because there are a lot of women in those positions now. (laughs) Good way to end on it. Thank you, Carol. We appreciate that very much. Thanks a lot.